Hello everyone, this is Mr. Millette with an AP World History presentation. Today's presentation is about the Cold War and its causes, major characteristics, and its consequences. In terms of the Cold War, AP World History students will be expected to be able to demonstrate their understanding of these five learning objectives. One, explain the causes and effects of the ideological struggle of the Cold War. Two, Compare the ways in which the United States and the Soviet Union sought to maintain influence over the course of the Cold War. Three, explain the causes and consequences of China's adoption of communism. Four, explain the causes and effects of movements to redistribute economic resources. And five, explain the causes of the end of the Cold War. First off, let's take a look at what and when exactly the Cold War was in history. The Cold War was a period of tense political, economic, military, and ideological relations between two prescribed supernations, the United States and the Soviet Union between 1945 and 1991. This tension created a world order for the better part of the second half of the 20th century. In order to address the learning objectives on the previous slide, I have organized this PowerPoint to focus on the following. First, American and Soviet ideological developments of the Cold War. Second, proximal conflicts or hot wars of the Cold War. Challenges to Soviet and American dominance during the Cold War. Cold War interactions, specifically between the United States and the Soviet Union. And finally, the end of the Cold War. To get into the American and Soviet ideological developments during the Cold War, we need to first understand that the Cold War was a time of great divide in the world. That divide was very recognizable even before the end of World War II but really solidified in the first few years after the war. In fact, in 1946, Winston Churchill, the former Prime Minister of England, described that Great Divide as an Iron Curtain. This political cartoon from the early part of the Cold War attempted to capture Churchill's concept of the Iron Curtain. In the political cartoon, you notice the stage with a curtain that appears to have some bolts in it to give it an iron look. On the iron curtain, you also see the identifiable emblem of the Soviet Union, the sickle and scythe, which was used to represent the cooperation of the agricultural and industrial workers in Russia under communism. In the foreground of the cartoon, you see a conductor and his orchestra in the midst of a musical performance. They are collectively labeled as the Western democracies. By Western democracies, it is meant to include nations such as England, France, and West Germany. Germany, as you will learn, would be divided after World War II. The joyous looks on the audience members listening to and applauding for the music of the Western democracies is juxtaposed with a character peeking under the Iron Curtain, as if to see what all the music is about. Dark hair, bushy mustache, on the other side of the Iron Curtain? You guessed it, that's Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union and the most powerful individual in Europe located east of the Iron Curtain. Why is he peeking? What is he looking for? Is he trying to gain insights to help his own nation out? Is it alluding to the espionage that would happen between the Eastern and Western European societies? Is he safe behind that curtain? Is he looking to take an opportunity to expand beyond that curtain? To Stalin's left, you see a sign that mentions the three blockade lifters. That's actually a reference to the Berlin airlift that would take place in 1948 which was an event that brought the Iron Curtain into a manifested reality when Stalin's military set up a blockade around the German city of Berlin and began preventing West Germans 
from entering West Berlin, an agreement that was made at the end of World War II between the Soviet Union and the Western democracies of England and France, as well as the United States. That blockade was overcome by English, French, and American military planes flying necessary food and resources over the blockade and into West Berlin. It was a tense 18 months during the Berlin airlift that nearly turned the third year of the Cold War into a potential outbreak of a very hot World War III. You're going to notice throughout this presentation that there were some iron curtains that emerge throughout the 20th century and throughout different parts of the world. Although when Churchill coined the term in 1946, he literally meant the divide between Eastern and Western Europe. Manifestations of that curtain would emerge in the divisiveness outside of Europe. The 38th parallel separating North and South Korea. The 17th parallel that temporarily separated North and South Vietnam. Or the embargo between the United States and Cuba. Perhaps the most identifiable identifiable manifestation of the Iron Curtain was in Europe. However, when in 1961, during a second crisis in Berlin, the iconic Berlin Wall was constructed to separate the eastern and western portions of the city, that manifestation of the Iron Curtain remained intact until 1989. In this slide, I have taken an excerpt from Churchill's Iron Curtain speech from 1946, so as to go directly to the source. It is clear that his speech was definitely written to capture the divisiveness between a liberal democratic and American-influenced Western Europe and a communist and Russian-influenced Eastern Europe. He stated, From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia. All these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere and all are subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from Moscow. The safety of the world, ladies and gentlemen, requires a unity in Europe, from which no nation should be permanently outcast. It is from the quarrels of the strong parent races in Europe that the world wars we have witnessed, or which occurred in former times, have sprung. Churchill recognized that Europe had been the hotbed for both world wars, and that Europe was shaping up for a similar situation just a year after World War II. What did division in Europe mean? Did it mean mutual segregation? Did it mean coexistence from a distance? Did it mean political and military tension? Did it mean gearing up for the potential of war? Did it mean ideological differences that created political, economic, and technological differences that could take measures to prevent war, but also move the world closer and closer to another destructive total war? I think all of these possibilities were characteristics of the potential of the Cold War, a time in which the Soviet Union and the United States never declared war against each other, but fueled conflicts and vied for peace negotiations in one of the world's most compelling international relationships in history. Here is a map of divided Europe during the Cold War. You can see the development of NATO and the Warsaw Pact, divisively staring each other down between Western and Eastern Europe. NATO and the Warsaw Pact will be American and Soviet developments that we will cover soon in this presentation. In math class, you may have heard your teacher talk about graphing a line of best fit. Well, this was my attempt at drawing a line of best fit to capture the geographic placement 
of Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain indicated in the dark line through the heart of Europe. The next three slides focus on the Soviet Union's major ideological, political, and economic developments of the early part of the Cold War. These developments set the foundation for the Soviet Union's goals, alliances, and political and military actions throughout the duration of the Cold War. If you will, they are de the developments that connected all of the states to the east of Churchill's Iron Curtain. It was also these developments that sought to bring non-European states into the Soviet sphere in parts of East Asia, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean and Latin America, and the Middle East. The first thing I want you all to be aware of was the Soviet Union's major political and economic developments in the early part of the Cold War. Politically, the Soviet Union sought to establish governments that were dominated by a single communist party, which took direction and mimicked their own communist party. So for example, the nation states to the east of the Iron Curtain like Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia were to have their own governments that were ran solely by their nation's communist party. So for example, there would be a communist party in Poland and it would determine the leadership of the Polish government. The expectation was all of these so-called satellite states and Soviet republics and their communist leaders would remain in alliance and good standing with the leaders of the Russian Communist Party back in Moscow. For the first eight years of the Cold War, that meant keeping a good relationship with Joseph Stalin. Economically, the Soviet Union established command economies, seeking social equality in which long-term economic planning and goal setting took precedence over individual wealth. Recall, Joseph Stalin had initiated his five years plan in the early years of the Great Depression during the interwar period. He collectivized farmland, set production quotas, enacted food and resource distribution policies, and ramped up Russia's industrialization. Basically, the nation states to the east of the Iron Curtain were expected to mimic Russia's command economy. That happened in Eastern Europe, but it also happened in places outside of Europe, like in China, North Korea, and Cuba, all places that turned to communism during the Cold War. A lot of the division in the early years of the Cold War was actually grounded in the decisions that were made in the meetings at the end of World War II. More specifically, the Yalta Conference from February of 1945, just three months before the German surrender in the war, was the conference that comprised the decisions regarding the United States, England, and Russia's political and military role in Europe after Axis defeat. One decision of the Big Three was to allow the Soviet Union to have a post-war role after the liberation of Axis-controlled European nations. The terms of the Yalta Conference spelled out a much more cooperative agreement than what actually played out in the first few years of the Cold War. Specifically, the agreements at Yalta stated, quote, to foster the conditions in which the liberated people may exercise these rights, the three governments will jointly assist the people in any European liberated state or former Axis state in Europe where, in their judgment, conditions require to establish conditions of internal peace, carry out emergency relief measures for the relief of distressed peoples, to form interim governmental authorities broadly representative of all democratic elements in the population, and pledge to the earliest possible establishment through free elections of governments responsive to the will of the people, and to facilitate, where necessary, the holding of such elections. As you can see, the Americans, the English, and the Soviets were to jointly meet these conditional requirements. However, when World War II ended and the American, English, and Soviet militaries stayed in their respective parts of Europe, and the leadership of the Big Three was so ideologically different 
both sides of the Iron Curtain settled into the divisiveness that characterized Europe and eventually much of the world. Recall, when I taught about World War I, and more specifically the main long-term causes to the war, the A in Maine had stood for alliances. We know that the alliances that were built in the decades prior to World War I were a major reason why so many nations were pulled into the conflict. Honoring and adhering to those military alliances forced a small local and regional issue to become a global conflict. Well, both sides of the Iron Curtain sought to build alliances. The Americans and the Soviets aimed to build alliances in and out of Europe to expand their political, economic, and cultural influences. For the Soviet Union, Stalin had established Comcon, or the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance. Comcon was established in order for the Soviet Union to finance European nations east of the Iron Curtain. Many of those places had been war-torn from Nazi occupation during the war. The Soviet Union looked to sort of buy their allies by offering economic aid in the reconstruction of those countries and the restructuring of those countries' economies. Eventually, nations outside of Europe, such as China and Cuba, that aligned with the Soviet Union, would receive economic aid from the Soviet Union. However, the biggest step that the Soviet Union took in building its alliances was the development of the Warsaw Pact in 1955. The Warsaw Pact was an international organization which included many Eastern European countries, coupled with the Soviet Union, giving the Soviet Union political and military alliances in this proverbial Cold War. The pact declared itself, quote, a treaty of friendship, cooperation, and mutual assistance among countries such as the Soviet Union, Albania, Bulgaria, Hungary, East Germany, Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. Back to the map of Europe during the Cold War, take a look at the pink-shaded region of Eastern Europe. Those are all of the nations that align with the Soviet Union through the Warsaw Pact from 1955. Understand, the Warsaw Pact was a response to the alliance building that had been happening between the United States and the nation states west of the Iron Curtain in the early years of the Cold War. The next three slides are portrait images of some of the most significant leaders of the Soviet Union throughout the Cold War. These Soviet leaders made their best efforts to extend aid to their communist allies, utilize their military to advance their goals of establishing command economies, and promote their ideologies and ways of life as not just an alternative to the capitalism and democracy of the American way, but as a superior ideology and way of life to the American way. This slide has a photo of Joseph Stalin, who came to power in the Soviet Union in 1928 and stayed in power until his death in 1953. Living only for the first eight years of the Cold War, Stalin set the agenda for the rest of the Soviet leaders to follow. He instituted his five years plan during the Depression and rapidly industrialized and militarized the Soviet Union. He aligned with the Allied powers and helped to defeat both Nazism and fascism in Europe, while his country's soldiers and civilians paid the ultimate price in the Soviet war effort during World War II. He was instrumental in the decisions made at Yalta, which ultimately empowered him and his military to keep such a large influence over parts of Central and all of Eastern Europe. He was the operator of Comcon and initiated the alliance building for the Soviet Union in the early part of the Cold War. He tested the Western democracies with a military blockade of the city of Berlin, and he attempted to force all political leaders east of the Iron Curtain to mimic his style. 
This slide focuses on the Soviet leader that would follow Joseph Stalin. Taking over as Soviet premier in 1956, Nikita Khrushchev was arguably the most powerful man in the world from 1953 until 1964. In his 11 years as the Soviet leader, Khrushchev was the mastermind behind the Warsaw Pact and built numerous military alliances with Central and Eastern European countries. He also sparked Russia's part in the arms race and space race it had against the United States. It was during Khrushchev's reign when the first unmanned satellite, Sputnik, was sent into space in 1957. He was in power when the first human being was sent into space to orbit the Earth in 1961. He was the leader who reached out to Fidel Castro after the communist revolution in Cuba had succeeded and solidified a long-term relationship between both nations. He was in power during the most tense time of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. There was also no nonsense with anyone who challenged his or the Soviet Union's authority. He violently had anti-communist revolutions in Hungary put down in 1956. This slide has a photo of Leonid Brezhnev, who was the successor as head of state of the Soviet Union after Khrushchev. Brezhnev was said to be as brutal and demanding as Stalin, and less likely than Khrushchev to engage in diplomacy with America. In his self-named Brezhnev Doctrine, Brezhnev took a page out of Khrushchev's book when in 1968 he had the Prague Spring, an anti-communist revolution in Czechoslovakia, put down. Under his orders, Soviet tanks rolled into Prague and violently squashed the movement and forced Czechoslovakia to remain a member of the Warsaw Pact. Brezhnev's most significant action as leader of the Soviet Union was initiating the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. He sparked a 10-year proxy war that sought to expand Russia's influence in the Middle East and turn Central Asia into a war zone. The next five slides focus on the United States' major ideological, political, and economic developments of the early part of the Cold War. These developments set the foundation for America's goals, alliances, and political and military actions throughout the duration of the Cold War. If you will, they are the developments that connected all of the states to the west of Churchill's Iron Curtain. It was also these developments that sought to bring non-European states into the American sphere in parts of East Asia, Southeast Asia, the Caribbean and Latin America, and the Middle East. The first thing I want you all to be aware of was the United States' major political and economic developments in the early part of the Cold War. Politically, the United States sought to establish governments that were democratic and anti-communistic. American leaders expected their allies to silence communism as much in their countries as they did in America. Economically, the United States permitted the rise of a consumer culture through its capitalistic-based economy and maintained strong government investment in technology, infrastructure, and weaponry. America sought to establish itself as the economic leader of the world and managed to work within the global economic structure of the World Trade Organization. It sought to instill its way of life in the economies and cultures of its allies in Western Europe and really initiated the process of Americanization. The United States would use its financial and economic status to promote reconstruction and economic readjustment in places that were deemed vulnerable to Soviet influence in an effort to help those places first, before the Soviets could help them. This slide focuses on America's foreign policy during the Cold War. That foreign policy would be summed up in one word, containment. For anyone who raises reptiles, more specifically an iguana, an iguana will grow to the size in which it is allowed in a provided habitat. 
For example, if an iguana is kept in a small aquarium, it'll grow just enough to fit inside that aquarium. However, if an iguana is given an entire screened-in room, you might end up with Godzilla. That was sort of the perception of the United States when it forged its foreign policy against the Soviet Union. Keep it contained. Don't give it too much room to grow, or else you're going to have a monster on your hands. Containment was a foreign policy started under President Truman, and it was meant to stop the growth of communism in post-World War II times. George Kennan, who was a statesman and eventually a U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, pushed Truman to adopt his theorized foreign policy of containment. He conveyed in his long telegraph in 1947 this, In these circumstances, it is clear that the main element of any United States policy toward the Soviet Union must be that of a long-term, patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expansive tendencies. It is important to note, however, that such a policy has nothing to do with outward histrionics with threats or blustering or superfluous gestures of outward toughness. Ken believed that the American military needed to be utilized to keep the Soviet Union in its lane and to not allow it into others' lanes. It wouldn't be long before Truman would have to test containment as his administration's foreign policy. As communism was popularizing in China and in Korea, much to the elation of the Soviet Union. How, quote, firm and vigilant, end quote, the containment would be was pretty much up to the discretion of each of the American presidents during the Cold War, as some would seek negotiation and diplomacy to keep Russia at bay, while others deployed troops in distant lands to keep Russia away. Much like the Soviets had created Comcon to provide economic assistance to Eastern and Central European states east of the Iron Curtain, the United States inaugurated the Marshall Plan to do the same thing, but for European states west of the Iron Curtain. The Marshall Plan was a policy under the Truman administration of economic support to war-torn European nations. Marshall Plan money was economic aid offered to European countries after World War II and enabled those countries to rebuild infrastructure and readjust economies. In a sense, the Marshall Plan was a way of America to buy up its allies. Again, places that may have been vulnerable to Soviet influence or economic aid, the Marshall Plan tried to preempt Soviet influence there. George Marshall, who had been an American soldier in World War I, had achieved the rank of general and served as chief of staff during World War II, gave life to the Marshall Plan, as he had first-hand understanding regarding Western Europe's severe lack of resources and finances and their severe vulnerability to Soviet influence. In 1947, Marshall declared, quote, the truth of the matter is that Europe's requirements for the next three or four years of foreign food and other essential products, principally from America, are so much greater than her present ability to pay that she must have substantial additional help or face economic, social, and political deterioration of a very grave character. The Marshall Plan transferred some $12 billion to Western European economies. Curiously, Marshall Plan money was offered to the Soviet Union. But Joseph Stalin turned the money down so as to show the world the Soviet Union did not need financial aid from the United States. This slide focuses on more economic aid that the United States provided to vulnerable places that needed financial aid. The Truman Doctrine, which was a policy under the Truman administration of economic support, would provide $400 million to Greece and Turkey after World War II when European nations could not provide that assistance. Geographically, Greece and Turkey were to the east of Churchill's Iron Curtain. 
Preemptively, the Truman Doctrine sought to provide aid to those two nations before Stalin could offer his Kumkon money to them. Another way, America could buy up some allies. In 1947, President Truman stated, quote, At the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. The choice is too often not a free one. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority, forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. Truman justified his actions by vilifying the Soviet Union, which became the American sentiment throughout the Cold War. No greater action step toward building alliances was taken than the development of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, otherwise known as NATO. In 1949, NATO became an alliance that provided for member nations to use armed force against an aggressor if a fellow nation is under attack. And it became a highly influential organization in a battered Western Europe. In accordance with the global political order of the day, set forth by the United Nations, NATO became the muscle behind much of the UN's goals. Although NATO, like the UN, was an international political organization, it did a lot of the grunt work of America's foreign policy of containment. In the text of the North Atlantic Treaty from 1949, it reads, quote, the parties to this treaty reaffirm their faith in the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations and their desire to live in peace with all peoples and all governments. They are determined to safeguard the freedom, common heritage, and civilization of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. They seek to promote stability and well-being in the North Atlantic area. They are resolved to unite their effort for collective defense and for the preservation of peace and security. They therefore agree to this North Atlantic Treaty, end quote. To put this in context, in response or retaliation against the development of NATO, the Soviet Union would create the Warsaw Pact to counteract. In the map on this slide, you can see the original members of NATO from 1949, shaded in dark green. Notice that Canada and Iceland were also original members. Also note that Greece and Turkey joined NATO by 1955. Thank you, Truman Doctrine. Beyond that, you can see that when the Cold War is over, many Eastern and Central European nations would join NATO. Fun fact. Russia is not a member of NATO today. The next two slides are portrait photos of the American presidents at the beginning of the Cold War. This slide has a photo of President Harry Truman. Recall Truman came to power after the death of Franklin Roosevelt in 1945, as he had been Roosevelt's vice president. Truman was responsible for the use of the atomic bombs, ending the war with Japan in World War II. Truman was also the president who employed containment as the American foreign policy that his successors would continuously employ throughout the Cold War. He outfitted nations with financial aid through the Marshall Plan and the Truman Doctrine. And he was in office when one of the first proxy wars or hot wars of the Cold War began, the Korean War. This slide has a photo of President Dwight Eisenhower, who was elected in 1952 and served two terms in office. Eisenhower was instrumental as the American general in supreme command of the Allied forces in the Western Front of World War II. 
he headed up Operation Overlord, which was the full-scale invasion of Nazi-occupied France, known as the D-Day invasion. Eisenhower employed the foreign policy of containment as he committed to action in the Middle East, specifically Iran, to remove a communist-influenced leader there. He was a believer in armaments development and developed an arsenal of ICBMs and nuclear weaponry in order to deter the Soviet Union from waging war against America. He believed in brinkmanship, massive retaliation, and that he had a willingness to take America to the brink of war if necessary and would be able to strike Russia swiftly and severely. It was during Eisenhower's reign that in the United States a second Red Scare occurred. And many political leaders, celebrities, and other high-profile people were silenced or blacklisted for being communist sympathizers. He was president of the United States when Cuba fell to Castro and was serving his eighth and final year in office when the U-2 spy plane incident occurred, which exposed Eisenhower's administration's practice of surveying Russian weapons developments. The next 19 slides all focus on the proxy wars or hot wars of the Cold War. Recall the Soviet Union and the United States never actually directly engaged in war with each other. However, in these proxy wars, their ideologies were tested in distant lands, globalizing the reach of the Cold War. Specifically, the next three slides focus on the first of those proxy wars, or hot wars, the Korean War. The Korean War began in 1950, and the fighting took place up through 1953. First, a little background to the Korean War. Korea had been occupied by Japan during World War II, and like other places that experienced Japanese occupation, it was a brutalized country by the end of World War II. In fact, the Japanese also utilized Korean women as comfort women during the war, much like they had done in China during their occupation period. Japan's defeat signaled that the Allied powers were going to have to oversee a return to normalcy for the places they liberated from the Japanese. This included Korea, and at the Potsdam Conference, decisions regarding how the Allies would manage Korea were determined. On the Potsdam conference in 1945, it was concluded, quote, Japan will also be expelled from all other territories which she has taken by violence and greed. The aforesaid three great powers, mindful of the enslavement of the people of Korea, are determined that in due course, Korea shall become free and independent. American military participation in the war against Japan and its liberation of so much of the Far East and the fact that it was overseeing all of the reconstruction of post-war Japan meant that America would have a presence in Korea. However, proximity to the Soviet Union meant that Russia would also have an influence on the developments of Korea. Furthermore, when China turned red, that is when Mao Zedong and his Communist Party succeeded in ousting Chiang Kai-shek and his nationals from China, to the island of Taiwan, and China became a communist state. It only magnified the Cold War tensions in the region. In the northern portion of Korea, a communist regime known as the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was established, and it was outfitted militarily and financially by both Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong, the two major communist leaders in the world by 1950. To the south, the established government was simply called the Republic of Korea, and at minimum was aligned with the United States, and in turn, it was outfitted militarily and financially by the United States. So North Korea's military invaded South Korea and in its attack sought to unify both Koreas under a single communist regime. The United States deployed its troops and fought alongside the South Korean soldiers as the North Koreans continued to push south. The Chinese became more involved in helping out their North Korean ally by committing troops to the conflict as well. The southern tip of Korea was the Pusan perimeter, 
and all but that small region of South Korea had been taken over by the North Koreans. However, with the maintenance of the Pusan perimeter, the American and South Korean forces began their counterattacks. Tensions mounted between and among the United States and Russia and China as the first proxy war of the post-World War II era took place. In fact, American General Douglas MacArthur, who had been the supreme commander of all Allied forces in the Pacific Theater during World War II and was currently overseeing the reconstruction of Japan, publicly threatened an invasion of China for their interference in the Korean War. In retaliation, President Truman fired General MacArthur from his position and sought to de-escalate the war. In 1953, a truce was signed by all of the belligerents, and the fighting stopped. The partition of both Koreas was agreed at the 38th parallel. A buffer zone between North and South Korean military bases was established, and it would be called the Demilitarized Zone, or the DMZ. Ultimately, a communist regime would be retained in North Korea, and a democratic government would develop in South Korea. South Korea joined the ranks of other post-World War II economic success stories. It advanced its production in automobiles and electronics and became known as one of the little tigers. Economically and technologically developed nations of the Far East that followed Japan's economic model. To be noted, the Korean War was actually put on hold, as it was a truce that was drawn in 1953. So technically, the Korean War is still going on, as the conflict has yet to be ended formally by treaty. The next 13 slides focus on another proxy war, or hot war, of the Cold War, the Vietnam War. One thing I want to make clear to students is that the war in Vietnam can be historically situated into the Cold War as well as the process of decolonization in the second half of the 20th century. As a proxy war or hot war of the Cold War, it was the stage for a pro-communist and anti-communist conflict in which the United States and the Soviet Union involved themselves. However, the Vietnam War can also be considered a decolonization effort in which Vietnamese people were able to gain their independence from France after World War II. The struggle for what kind of government would emerge in Vietnam and whether Vietnam would be a unified or divided country is where the Cold War and decolonization meet in this historical event that characterized a lot of the 1960s and 1970s. In the primary source on this screen, you see Ho Chi Minh's Program for Communism in Indochina, published in 1930. In 1930, Vietnam was still a part of French Indochina, an overseas French colony in Southeast Asia that dated back to the late 1800s during the age of imperialism. Ho Chi Minh was a Vietnamese nationalist who attended the Paris Peace Conference after World War I and pled for Vietnamese independence from the French, but to no avail. Ho Chi Minh then radicalized more as both a nationalist and a communist in Southeast Asia. He became a leading voice for the Vietnamese people in both regards. Notice how in his program, on this slide, he encouraged both the overthrow of France and to implement pro-communist measures for the working class and productivity of an independent Vietnam. A nationalist and a communist embodied in one political leader. He wrote, workers, peasants, soldiers, youth, pupils, oppressed and exploited compatriots, the Communist Party of Indochina is founded. It is the party of the working class. It will help the proletarian class lead the revolution in order to struggle for all the oppressed and exploited people. From now on, we must pin the party, help it, and follow it in order to implement the following slogans. To overthrow Fl uh, French imperialism, feudalism, and the reactionary Vietnamese capitalist class. To make Indochina completely independent. 
to establish a worker, peasant, and soldier government, to confiscate the banks and other enterprises belonging to the imperialists and put them under the control of the worker, peasant, and soldier government, to confiscate all of the plantations and property belonging to the imperialists and the Vietnamese reactionary capitalist class and distribute them to the poor peasants, to implement the eight-hour working day, to abolish public loans and poll tax, to waive unjust taxes hitting the poor people, to bring back all freedom to the masses, carry out universal education, and to implement equality between man and woman. Another thing to understand is that historians can divide the Vietnam War into two different parts. The earliest part of the conflict was the Vietnamese independence struggle against France, which lasted from 1945 until 1954. The later part of the conflict was the Cold War phase, in which American forces and Red China's influence would get involved. During the interwar period, Vietnamese nationalism intensified under the leadership of Ho Chi Minh. During World War II, France was shown to be weak in and out of Europe, as the Germans ran through France and the Japanese ran through French Indochina in 1940. Japanese occupation over French Indochina in the last four years of World War II proved to nationalists like Ho Chi Minh that France was too weak to protect the Vietnamese people from outside invasion, and that France was also too weak to handle a Vietnamese war for independence. In 1945, a Vietnamese Declaration of Independence was drafted, and you can see an excerpt from it at the bottom of this slide. It stated, Nevertheless, for more than 80 years, the French imperialists, abusing the standard of liberty, equality, and fraternity, have violated our fatherland and depressed our fellow citizens. They have acted contrary to the ideals of humanity and justice. Drawing on both the 18th century's French Revolution slogan of liberty, equality, and fraternity, as well as the 18th century American Declaration of Independence, in which an imperial system was blamed for abuses against colonists, action would be taken in the wake of this publication. Of course, France, as in the case of the end of World War I, did not want to relinquish control of their colony in Indochina after World War II. But this time around, they would have to fight for it. French forces were deployed into Vietnam and other parts of French Indochina in order to retain control of the area. The French learned quickly that the nationalistic resistance of the Vietnamese people was too much for them to break. Yet, they continued to try throughout the next nine years. Finally, after the Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954, the French government surrendered to the Viet Minh, or the Vietnamese Communist Nationalist Army. After Dien Bien Phu, the Geneva Accords would be drafted, and I've provided an excerpt of those accords here. It reads, The conference takes note of the declaration of the French government to the effect that it is ready to withdraw its troops from the territory of Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. At the request of the government's Concerned and within a period which shall be fixed by agreement between the parties, except in the cases where, by agreement between the two parties, a certain number of French troops shall remain at specified points and for a specified time. Ultimately, the Accords recognize the independence of not only Vietnam, but also Laos and Cambodia, the other two nations formed out of the decolonization effort and dissolution of French Indochina and in Southeast Asia. The Accords also dictated the terms of the French removal of its troops from the region. Unfortunately for the Vietnamese people, there was great division among them. In the northern portion of Vietnam, the Viet Minh and Ho Chi Minh were heroes who had just won a war for independence. They saw themselves as the leader of all the Vietnamese people and sought to establish a communist government in the region. However, in South Vietnam, a government was formed that was anti-communist and supported by the United States. This division was solidified at the 17th parallel, but soon the conflict would spill over the boundary. and The conflict went from being an independence movement to a proxy war of the Cold War. 
American presidents during the Vietnam War executed their foreign policy of containment to contain the spread of communism into South Vietnam and to protect the Republic of South Vietnam from the communists of North Vietnam. In 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson, who had been president not quite a year since replacing President John F. Kennedy after his assassination in November of 1963, decided to escalate American military involvement in Vietnam. Predicated on a controversial and muddled report of a North Vietnamese attack on an American naval destroyer called the USS Maddox in the Gulf of Tonkin off the coast of North Vietnam, President Johnson mobilized more American soldiers to put down the North Vietnamese. In addition to American soldiers battling with North Vietnamese forces, they also had to deal with the presence of communist sympathizers in South Vietnam called the Viet Cong, who attacked American and South Vietnamese troops and targets throughout South Vietnam. In 1968, during the Vietnamese New Year, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese soldiers waged a large surprise offensive attack against the South Vietnamese and American soldiers. The Tet Offensive claimed nearly 10,000 American and South Vietnamese soldiers' lives. President Johnson responded by deploying more American troops to Vietnam. After the Tet Offensive, the Vietnam War became very unpopular with a lot of the American public. Strain from America's involvement in the war was a contributing factor to President Johnson's refusal to run for re-election in 1968. With the election of 1968, Richard Nixon, who had served as vice president during the Eisenhower administration in the 50s, would become the new president of the United States. In 1970, Nixon ordered an American invasion into neighboring Cambodia to defeat North Vietnamese, Viet Cong, and communist sympathizers across the border in Cambodia. This action was also highly criticized by anti-war protesters back home in the United States. Ultimately, in spite of his expansion of the conflict, President Nixon would be responsible for the Vietnamization of the war. That is, the gradual removal of American forces in the area and the transitioning of the conflict to one that the South Vietnamese would manage. In the end, the North Vietnamese would overcome the South Vietnamese and unify the country of Vietnam under a single communist government. The city of Saigon, the South Vietnamese capital and location of the U.S. Embassy, was seized in 1975 by the North Vietnamese. In the image on the bottom left of this slide, you can see an iconic photograph of American employees in the U.S. Embassy being rescued by helicopter in the North Vietnamese's takeover of Saigon in 1975. America's policy of containment had failed to stop Southeast Asia from falling to communism. As a unified Vietnam, an independent Laos, and an independent Cambodia, all developed communist governments in the region throughout the 1970s. One thing is for sure, the Vietnam War's actions were reported via radio and television broadcasts. Video and photographic images depicted the inhumanity of the war. The next four slides show some of the most iconic images from the Vietnam War and the levels of inhumanity that this Cold War proxy conflict reached. The image on this slide is a photograph of a Buddhist monk named Thich Quang Duc. Duke had experienced the religious intolerance and violent attacks of the South Vietnamese military on Buddhist temples in Saigon and other parts of South Vietnam. In 1963, the Republic of South Vietnam was governed by No Di Diem, and even though he was supported by the American government for being an anti-communist who stood in defiance of the communist movement in North Vietnam, he was vicious against Buddhists living in his South Vietnam. No D. Diem was a Roman Catholic, as his family had been Christianized during the French period of imperialism in Southeast Asia. Diem let his personal religious convictions dictate his intolerant acts against Buddhists and other non-Christians in South Vietnam. 
in response to these intolerant acts against Buddhist temples and monasteries, many Buddhist monks began to demonstrate their disdain for Diem's actions. In this image, Thich Quang Duc practiced self-immolation, a practice of self-sacrifice through setting oneself on fire. Duke did this on a busy street in the middle of the day in Saigon and died in front of urban onlookers. The imagery of this scene went international, and it contributed to shifting American support away from Diem's rule in South Vietnam. This next photograph has become an iconic image of the Vietnam War. It shows a South Vietnamese general, General Lo An, executing a captured member of the Viet Cong in the streets of Saigon in 1968. Not only did the photograph go viral for its brutal and unforgiving representation of close-range execution, but the video footage of this execution was also aired internationally. It drew both criticism and justification from viewers and became one of the most controversial images of the entire war. The Vietnam War pinned American chemical and weapons advancement against North Vietnamese and Viet Cong guerrilla warfare tactics. To counteract successful North Vietnamese and Viet Cong guerrilla attacks in the canopy jungles of Vietnam, American leaders ordered aerial attacks over the area so as to stamp out the guerrillas and destroy the canopy jungles for better aerial visibility of the enemy. American planes, like the ones shown here, dispersed Agent Orange throughout the jungles of North and South Vietnam. Agent Orange was a potent herbicide that killed the trees of the Vietnamese jungles and exposed enemies to follow up with aerial assaults. However, Agent Orange had long-lasting effects on people who had been exposed to the chemicals. Soldiers and civilians who were exposed to Agent Orange would later be diagnosed with cancer, liver failure, and other lethal side effects. Many infants born in Vietnam were born with birth defects caused by the mother's exposures to the chemicals in Agent Orange. This slide has another iconic image from the Vietnam War. In the photo, you can see children and South Vietnamese soldiers fleeing from the smoke and explosions in the background. The South Vietnamese Air Force had conducted an aerial attack on a South Vietnamese village that had been deemed a holding ground for the enemy Viet Cong. However, in the town were hundreds of innocent South Vietnamese civilians, including these children and South Vietnamese soldiers, who had to flee from friendly fire. The attack on this South Vietnamese town included the use of napalm. Napalm is a highly flammable substance that was used in bombing raids in the Vietnam War and caused massive fires in villages and the countryside. The central figure of this image is a young girl who is completely nude in the full uncensored photograph amidst her family and childhood friends who had thrown off her clothes because they had caught fire during the air raid. The next four slides are images of some of the leaders during the Vietnam War. On this slide, you see President John F. Kennedy. Kennedy was president from 1961 until his assassination in 1963. Kennedy defeated Richard Nixon in the 1960 election, which during the campaign included the first ever televised presidential debate in American history. Kennedy increased both financial support and the number of American military advisors in South Vietnam, so that No D Dim and the South Vietnamese Army could continue fighting against Ho Chi Minh's North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. Kennedy was also president during some of the most tense times in the Cold War, including issues with Cuba in 1961 and 1962, to include the Bay of Pigs invasion and the Cuban Missile Crisis both events which will be addressed later in this presentation. Kennedy was also a supporter of the American space program and challenged America with the task of being the first nation of putting a man on the moon. That was achieved in 1969 
which is also addressed later in this presentation. This slide has a photo of President Lyndon B. Johnson. Johnson served as Kennedy's vice president and took office immediately after Kennedy's assassination in 1963. He took the presidential oath of office while aboard Air Force One. Johnson was president during the early escalation of American involvement in the Vietnam War. His actions, as well as his successor's actions in the Vietnam War, yielded a large anti-war movement in the United States. He was president during the Tet Offensive and the immediate escalation of America's involvement afterward. He was also president when the notorious My Lai Massacre took place in 1968. This slide is a photo of President Richard Nixon. Nixon was elected in 1968 and served as president from 1969 until his resignation in 1974. Nixon ordered the invasion of Cambodia in 1970, which expanded the war and seemingly countered the practice of Vietnamization that had recently started in the eyes of his critics. Demonstrations against this action took place across the United States, including Kent State University in Ohio where four student protesters were killed by Ohio National Guardsmen during the demonstrations. Following Nixon's resignation, his successor Gerald Ford would declare the end of America's involvement in Vietnam in 1975. This slide is a photo of Ho Chi Minh, the Vietnamese nationalist and communist who oversaw the transition of the Vietnamese peoples from a subject colonial peoples to a free and independent peoples after World War II. He had been a participant at the Paris Peace Conference in 1919 when he was 29 years old. There he pressed the Allied leaders to grant the people of French Indochina their independence, but to no avail. He helped to intensify Vietnam's nationalistic movement during the interwar period. And after World War II, he led the North Vietnamese army, the Viet Minh, against the French. In 1954, the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu, and the Vietnamese people were free from French control. He led the Viet Minh against No D Diem's Republic of South Vietnam, which ultimately drew American involvement into the conflict. His name was synonymous with the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was a network of roads that were utilized by both his Viet Minh and the Viet Cong in their victories against the South Vietnamese. In Vietnam, he also has a city named after him to honor his legacy, Ho Chi Minh City. The next three slides focus on our last proxy war, or hot war, of the Cold War, and that is the Soviet-Afghan War from 1979 to 1989. Some background to this conflict. First, understand that the Middle East was not immune to or off limits from the Cold War. Cold War tensions were in Iran, Egypt, and they're going to end up in Afghanistan in the later part of the Cold War. Geographically, Afghanistan's northern region borders Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Each of those nations had come under Soviet influence, as they were all Soviet republics in Asia. To their northern borders was Russia, the head of the Soviet Union, and it was through Russia's military presence in those Soviet republics that enabled a Soviet invasion into Afghanistan in 1979. The Soviets deployed tanks into Afghanistan, as well as an aerial invasion into Kabul in eastern Afghanistan. Leonid Brezhnev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time of the invasion, justified his orders for the invasion so as to force a transition in Afghanistan's government to a pro-Soviet government that would prevent terrorist attacks by Afghans against Soviet populations in Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. To the United States and their allies, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was for Russian control of territory, resources, and increased global power. Although the Soviet Union was the military giant of the region, much like the United States experienced in Vietnam, the Soviet military struggled with the resistance and guerrilla warfare tactics employed by Afghan soldiers. Specifically, the Mujahideen, which was an Islamic group that sought to preserve Afghanistan's culture and defend it from Soviet influence, fought tirelessly 
to rid Afghanistan of the Soviet military. In the photo on the bottom left of the screen, you can see an image of some Mujahideen fighters with advanced weaponry. The United States began to support Afghanistan in an effort to uphold their foreign policy of containment and contain Soviet communism from overtaking Afghanistan. President Ronald Reagan's support included the shipment of American weapons to the Mujahideen fighters and other anti-Soviet resistance groups throughout Afghanistan. The Soviet's military, plus its support and weapons lending to the Afghan pro-Soviet government, would elongate this conflict. The Soviets were also notorious for utilizing landmines, like the Green Parrot, pictured in the photo to the bottom left, in rural communities of Afghanistan. Ultimately, the Soviet-Afghan war became extremely difficult, disadvantageous, costly, unwinnable, and unpopular in the minds of many throughout the world. That sentiment was shared with Brezhnev's successor to the head of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev, who was much more inclined to cooperate with international and American directives than any preceding Soviet leader was ever willing, finally pulled the switch on the war and ordered all Soviet troops to leave Afghanistan in 1989. The aftermath of the Soviet-Afghan War was an Afghan civil war that took place throughout the 1990s. Out of that civil war was the development of a strict and fundamentalist Islamic government known as the Taliban. The Taliban would govern over most of Afghanistan from 1996 until 2001, after the United States would invade Afghanistan in the aftermath of the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001. The next 10 slides are going to focus on the challenges that both the Soviet Union and the United States endured during the Cold War. Historically, it has been a universally accepted truth that these two nations were superpowers and that they pretty much directed the world politically, economically, and militarily. And though they were the two nations most responsible for the new world order of things for the second half of the 20th century, it doesn't mean that superpower status came easily or came without resistance. The next three slides will specifically focus on challenges that the Soviet Union experienced in its own backyard in Eastern Europe. The first challenge to the Soviet Union was the challenge of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia had been a newly formed nation after World War I. It was the unified Slavic nation that involved Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, and a host of other nationalities that had long vied for their independence from the once mighty Austro-Hungarian Empire. After World War II, when Joseph Stalin began to forge alliances with Eastern European nation states, Yugoslavia opted to make its own path of communism distinct from the Soviet Union. Yugoslavia, which is east of Churchill's Iron Curtain, became a thorn in the paw of Stalin and the Soviet Union. Marshal Tito, who was the head of the Yugoslav Communist Party and the Yugoslav government, accepted Stalin's expulsion of Yugoslavia from the Soviet bloc and had long refused Soviet financial aid. In spite of countless attempts on Marshal Tito's life by Stalin's henchmen, Marshal Tito remained in power over Yugoslavia from 1944 until his death in 1980. Yugoslavia would remain non-aligned to the Soviets and the Americans throughout the entirety of the Cold War. This slide focuses on another challenge to the Soviet Union that also came from the east of Churchill's Iron Curtain, Hungary. Joseph Stalin had passed away in 1953, and in many ways that was seemingly a breath of fresh air for some of the communist leaders in the Soviet satellite states. He was cruel, demanding, and unforgiving, and oftentimes very critical against those who questioned his decisions and demands. In 1956, Nikita Khrushchev, Stalin's successor, had actually initiated his policies of de-Stalinization, which in part were aimed at relaxing some of the tension mounted between Russia and the satellite states of Eastern Europe. 
In Hungary, it seemed like the perfect time to begin promoting a new form of communism or a true socialism that would bring economic benefit to those that had been left out of the benefits under the brutal Stalinist system. Imre Naj, who was the head of the Hungarian Communist Party and served as the nation's prime minister, promoted this new directional path for Hungary. Nikita Khrushchev, in spite of his earlier directives, did not appreciate Naj's alternative views. As 1956 continued, Hungarian demonstrations against Russia intensified, and eventually Khrushchev sent in the Soviet tanks to put down Naj's revolution. Eventually, Naj was arrested, tried for treason, and executed. Hungary would remain a Soviet satellite state until after 1989. This slide focuses on a third challenge to the Soviet Union that was sparked nearby on the eastern side of Churchill's Iron Curtain in Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia, like Hungary, had been a newly formed nation after World War I. It was completely taken over and occupied by the Nazis during World War II. After World War II, it became a Soviet satellite state and took a lot of direction from Moscow. In the beautiful city of Prague was where the Czechoslovakian Communist Party and government was housed. Its leader, Alexander Dubček, was a bit of a revisionist of Stalinist communism. He disagreed with the brutality of the Soviet system, much like Imranaj had disagreed a decade earlier, and sought to develop a so-called socialism with a human face in Czechoslovakia. He had a great disdain for the inhumanity of the Soviet system and ultimately became the voice and face of Prague Spring in 1968. By that time, Leonid Brezhnev had replaced Nikita Khrushchev as the head of the Soviet Union. And in very Stalin and Khrushchev fashion, Brezhnev deployed Soviet tanks into Prague to put down Prague Spring. Czechoslovakia remained a Soviet satellite state until 1989. And when it freed itself from Soviet grasp, Alexander Dubček, the leader of Prague Spring, was made Czechoslovakia's first head of state. The next five slides focus on direct challenges against American superpower status during the Cold War. Much like their Russian counterparts, America's authority in the world during the Cold War was challenged by new developments and leaders. Specifically, the next three slides focus on China as a challenge to American dominance during the Cold War. China turned red in 1949 with the end of the Chinese Civil War and the ascension of the Chinese Communist Party to power. Conflict between Mao Zedong's communists and Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists had been started during the interwar period. That conflict was put on hold while China dealt with Japanese invasion and occupation during World War II. However, once Japan was defeated and forced to leave China, the communists and the nationalists uh, excuse me, recommenced with their civil war. Ultimately, Chiang Kai-shek and his nationalists were defeated and forced to leave mainland China. Most of them moved to the island of Taiwan off of China's southern coast. This was a new era in China, the era of Mao, pictured in the bottom left of this slide. Now two communist nations existed. Russia and China, two of the largest nations in the world, and they neighbored each other. China's turn to red would make America's containment of communism extremely difficult, as indicated in the anti-communist propaganda in the top left of this slide. The red China meant that the rest of the Far East was vulnerable to its influence, and that would spell out true in both the Korean War and the Vietnam War in the decades to come. Mao Zedong was a student of both Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin, the OGs of communism in the 20th century. Mao had been an idealist and theorist like Lenin, but once in power tended to follow Stalin's pattern. Mao was impressed with the success of Stalin's five years plan during the interwar period 
and sought to mimic that rapid industrialization and production in China. He inaugurated his Great Leap Forward in 1958 and emphasized coal, steel, and iron production. The goal was to rapidly industrialize and modernize China and bring great benefit to working class people in China, as seen in the Maoist propaganda in the image on the bottom left of this slide. Like Stalin, he collectivized farms by stripping land from Chinese nobles and well-off free peasants and converted them into work communes. The communes offered minimal benefits of health care and primary education, but the expectations for food production were high. Although Mao did lead China to develop new agricultural technologies, like the tractors seen in the photo of a peasant commune in the photo to the top left of this slide, it did not mean that food production and distribution was managed perfectly. Like Stalin's five years plan, Mao's food distribution policies were faulty and caused widespread famine throughout China. Historians have challenged the lack of success of Mao's great leap forward as more like a great step backward. Mao Zedong felt his control over China slipping away in the 1960s, and so he promoted an idea of permanent revolution, that is for Chinese society to never become comfortable and complacent and to always be taking up the communist struggle. With that, he began what became known as the Great Cultural Proletarian Revolution, or simply put, the Cultural Revolution. This was an attempt to reaffirm communism and Maoism in China, and continuing to rid China of any capitalistic influences. Mao's wave of propaganda was comparable to that of Stalin or Hitler from years past. A publication of Mao's quotations became mandatory in the households of Chinese citizens. So-called the Little Red Book became like China's Bible during the Cultural Revolution. Mao also sought to rid any objectors to his communist system and called on China's youth to take action against older members of society who had lived through the troubling times of Mao's Great Leap Forward. Much like that, of the Hitler Youth Program in Nazi Germany, Mao's Red Guards took up positions of authority, intelligence, and security to reinforce Mao's doctrine in China. The Red Guards are indicated by the red badges around their arms and are seen in the Cultural Revolution propaganda in the top left of this slide. Mao would remain in power in China until his death in 1976, nearly 30 years of harsh communist rule in China under Mao would finally begin to see some relaxation and transition away from Maoist brutality after 1976. However, Mao's portrait still hangs in Tiananmen Square, adjacent to the Forbidden City in Beijing, China today. The next two slides focus on another challenge to American dominance during the Cold War, and this one is right in America's backyard. Cuba. Cuba went through a communist revolution in 1957, led by Fidel Castro. Castro's regime seized control of all land and financial assets on the island, and that included land and assets owned by Americans and American businesses. Castro nationalized sugar plantations and other moneymakers in Cuba, and saw the long history between America and Cuba as one of capitalistic exploitation in which all the benefit went to the United States. Many anti-Castro Cubans fled to the United States to avoid Castro's wrath. In response, the United States enacted an embargo so as to punish Castro economically for his revolution in Cuba. In effect, Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, saw this as an opportunity to befriend Castro seen in the image to the left on this screen, and send massive amounts of economic aid and military support to Cuba. The American president in 1961 was John F. Kennedy, and he decided to employ the foreign policy that preceded him, containment. All this large nation had to do was deploy some troops into that tiny island of Cuba, and voila, communism contained. 
and out of the Caribbean and Latin America for good, right? Well, in 1961, Kennedy oversaw a CIA covert operation that involved Cuban refugees who were trained by Americans to be deployed in Cuba. At the Bay of Pigs, these Cuban refugees, armed with American weapons and trained by American CIA agents, were to establish a beachhead, drum up some anti-Castro support, and begin a counter-revolution against Castro in Cuba. Ultimately, most of the refugees were either killed or imprisoned, as Castro's military quickly put down the Bay of Pigs invasion. Next, Khrushchev began to supply Soviet ICBMs to Cuba, who held them in silos near some newly constructed launch pads. The United States found out about these weapons placements due to aerial photography taken by American spy planes over Cuba. This prompted the 14-day Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962, as Russians and Americans and Cubans sat on pins and needles seeing what these leaders would do. With the potential for World War III to begin in the Caribbean, the leaders had to figure things out before it got out of hand. Soviet ships continued to bring armaments into Cuba in spite of warnings by the United States. Kennedy then opted to invoke a quarantine in which U.S. naval ships would attempt to halt Soviet ships, inspect those ships, and either have them turn back or allow them to continue to Cuba. Different from a blockade, Kennedy refused to allow the American vessels to fire at Russian vessels. In the most intense moment of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the first Soviet vessel to encounter an American naval vessel refused to be inspected. However, it did opt to turn away from Cuba. Ultimately, Kennedy and Khrushchev agreed to end the crisis. And in return for Khrushchev's removal of missiles out of Cuba, Kennedy agreed to remove missiles out of Turkey. Castro would retain his position in power and continued to rule over Cuba until his death in 2016 at the age of 90. This slide focuses on a development that challenged the dominance of both the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War, and that was the non-aligned movement. The non-aligned movement appealed to newly formed nations after World War II, who saw both the Soviet Union and the United States as a late 20th century rendition of the age of imperialism. Many African and Asian leaders of newly independent nations aligned with the non-aligned movement, so as to choose a third path to economic and technological development in the second half of the 20th century. The non-aligned doctrine would be set at the Bandung Conference in Bandung City, in Indonesia in 1955. The first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru, pervade the non-aligned movement's objective. We do not agree with the communist teachings. We do not agree with the anti-communist teachings, because they are both based on wrong principles. I am dead certain that no country can conquer India. Even the two great power blocks together cannot conquer India not even the atom or the hydrogen bomb. I know also that if we rely on others, whatever great powers they might be, if we look to them for sustenance, then we are weak indeed. Initially, 29 nations had representatives at Bandung, and among them were the leaders from India, Pakistan, and Indonesia, all newly independent nations after World War II. As decolonization continued in the second half of the 20th century, especially in Africa, more nations joined the movement as the movement grew to over 100 nations. In spite of the non-alignment movement's goals of political and economic independence from the Soviet Union and the United States, many nations still remain dependent on either of those two nations. The next 11 slides focus on the close interactions that the United States and the Soviet Union had during the Cold War. Some of those interactions were tense and almost put the world into a catastrophic nuclear war. But some of those interactions were a bit more lighthearted, as in the case of the diplomatic attempts made by both nations during the years of detente. 
which we will look at later in this presentation. Tense or relaxed, Soviet and American interactions were always characterized by competition. The first point of interaction to address was the Berlin Airlift in 1948 and 1949. As mentioned earlier in this presentation, the German city of Berlin was an international city patrolled by the Soviets in the eastern portion of the city and patrolled by the French, English, and Americans in the western portion of the city. What's more, the city of Berlin was actually located in the German Democratic Republic, or the GDR, or more simply, in East Germany. Agreements after World War II among the nations involved allowed for West Germans to travel into East Germany and into West Berlin. However, in 1948, Joseph Stalin had the Soviet military establish a blockade around the entire city of Berlin. The Soviets closed roads and rail lines in an attempt to strangle and starve West Berlin into submission. To counteract, the United States and England supplied West Berliners with round-the-clock airlift missions, in which they deployed over 1.5 million tons of supplies for West Berliners over an 11-month period. Eventually, Stalin would call off the blockade, but just one shot by a Soviet anti-aircraft weapon in World War III could have broken out. Berlin as a divided city and Germany as a divided nation played out two very different experiences through the duration of the Cold War. In East Germany, along with East Berliners, many of them suffered from the communist system that was implemented. Life was hard. Food was scarce. Luxury was unheard of. However, in West Germany, and as in the case of West Berliners, an economic miracle occurred as West Germany's economy prospered and American financial aid continued to pour in. Defectors from East Berlin sought to flee to West Berlin and into West Germany so as to escape the harsh life of communism. Eventually, in 1961, the Berlin Wall was constructed and defection became nearly impossible for East Germans and East Berliners. This slide focuses on a bit more of a light-hearted interaction between the Soviet Union and the United States, the 1959 kitchen debate. Vice President Richard Nixon accepted an invitation from Nikita Khrushchev to visit Moscow and engage in diplomatic talks and a friendly debate in a mock American-style kitchen. They sipped Coca-Cola and exchanged pleasantries, and the debate commenced. Nixon boasted about the consumer technology that the American capitalistic system had created, as he pointed out the electric stove and the electric dishwasher. Khrushchev seemed unfazed by Nixon's claims and rebutted every one of Nixon's points. When Nixon claimed that dishwashers made domestic life easier for American housewives, Khrushchev rebutted by saying that in Russia, women are not confined to the homes and hinted at social and gender equality of the Soviet Union and the continued patriarchy of capitalistic America. The debate eventually moved beyond the props in the kitchen, and Khrushchev and Nixon told why the others should follow their lead. Khrushchev commented that the Americans can follow the Soviets in all facets, much like they watched the Soviet space program launch into space and then decided to follow after. One of the most intense aspects of Soviet and American interactions was the competition between the new nations in the space race. After World War II, both nations began their space programs and both sought to lead the world in space exploration. Russia seemed to get off the blocks first in the space race, as they sent the first unmanned satellite into space in 1957 with the launching of Sputnik. Four years later, the Soviets sent the first human into space to orbit the Earth in 1961. Pictured in the top right of this slide is cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, just before his orbit. Shortly after the Soviets sent up their first cosmonaut, the Americans would send astronaut Alan Shepard into space. And one year later, astronaut John Glenn became the first American to orbit Earth. They are both pictured in the bottom left of this slide. This slide shows the two of the most significant achievements in the Soviet-American space race. The photo to the left is one of the Soviet satellite Sputnik 
which was launched into space in 1957. The photo to the right is of American astronaut Buzz Aldrin on the moon after Apollo 11 successfully landed on the moon in 1969. In addition to the Soviet-American space race, these two superpowers competed in a nuclear arms race. Both began producing intercontinental ballistic missiles that had the capability of hitting targets thousands of miles away. Military budgets in both nations were increased. Production of ICBMs increased. Placement of ICBMs became controversial, and both nations' governments appeared to have a willingness to test and utilize ICBMs. Curiously, in spite of massive development of such capable weapons, the Soviets and the Americans never utilized them against each other. Due to the arms race, American and Soviet espionage became a frequent practice in the military intelligence in both nations. Both sides were aware that espionage was happening, but catching spies and punishing spies was a completely different thing. American pilot Gary Powers was sent on a surveillance mission across Europe in his U-2 spy plane to take aerial photographs of Soviet weaponry. While flying over the Ural mountain range in Russia, his plane was located by Soviet radar, an uncommon thing to happen for the stealthy U-2 spy planes. The Soviets shot Powers' plane out of the sky, and he ejected himself from the plane and parachuted safely into Russian territory. He was arrested and held in a Russian prison until 1962. This incident, which took place after the kitchen debate in 1959 and before Nikita Khrushchev could make his scheduled visitation to Washington, D.C. in 1960, foiled some of the diplomatic talks that had recently been started. The following year was the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1961, and then in 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. This incident seemed to kick off a greater and more intense negative relationship between Russia and America. The next three slides focus on the attempt by both the Soviet Union and the United States' as governments attempting to relax the militant and political tensions that characterize their relationship. This period of relative positive diplomacy between the two nations was known as detente. As an era of cooperation, detente involved Soviet and American political leaders exchanging international visits and signing agreements regarding weapons manufacturing. One groundbreaking agreement was the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons Treaty, or the NPT, that both nations, along with a host of others, agreed to in 1968. An excerpt from the NPT is at the bottom of this slide, and it reads, Each of the parties to the treaty undertake to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament, and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict and effective international control. Years later, in 1975, American and Soviet leaders agreed to the Helsinki Accords in Finland, as the two nations, as well as other nations, agreed to preserve human rights within their respective spheres. One of the last well-intended developments of detente between the Soviets and the Americans was the Strategic Arms Limitations Talks, or SALT. Beginning in 1972, these talks sought to minimize both nations' developments of ICBMs and submarine-launched missiles. This slide includes some of the excerpts from Soviet and American agreements made during the era of detente in the 1970s. From the SALT-1 agreements in 1972, it reads, Article 2, the parties undertake not to convert land-based launchers for light ICBMs or for ICBMs of older types deployed prior to 1964 into land-based launchers for heavy ICBMs of types deployed after that time. Article 3, the parties undertake to limit submarine-launch ballistic missiles, launchers and modern ballistic missile submarines, 
to the numbers operational and under construction on the date of signature of this interim agreement. And in addition to launchers and submarines constructed under procedures established by the parties as replacements for an equal number of ICBM launchers of older types deployed prior to 1964 or for launchers on old submarines. From the Helsinki Accords in 1975, it reads, the participating states will respect human rights and fundamental uh, freedoms, including the freedom of thought, conscience, religion, or belief for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. Detente was also extended to include the improvement of the relationship between the United States and China. Pictured here to the bottom left is a photo of American President Richard Nixon and Chinese diplomat Zhou Enlai in a diplomatic visitation in 1972. After Mao's death in 1976, Chinese leadership sought to open China's economy to the United States, and the diplomatic talks continued between the new Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping, and American President Jimmy Carter in 1979. The tense interactions and relationships between the Soviet Union and the United States played out in pop culture, entertainment, and sports throughout the 1970s and 80s. In the 1972 Summer Olympics in Munich, West Germany, the American and Russian men's basketball teams played in the gold medal game. In a tight game the entire way, the final three seconds were mired in controversy. With the score 50 to 49, with the United States in the lead, a controversial timeout was called and awarded to the Soviet Union. Under several protests by the American coaching staff, the Soviets ended up having three inbound attempts to make a final basket. The American coaching staff argued that the first timeout should have never been granted as it was awarded in the midst of an American player's free throw. At that time, international rules in basketball would have started the clock immediately after the foul shot was made. The three inbound attempts that would be awarded to the Soviet Union in the final three seconds ultimately enabled the Soviet Union to capitalize on a last-second layup, and defeat the Americans by one point, and claim their gold medals. The American men's basketball team refused to accept the silver medals, and those silver medals are still in a vault in Switzerland. In the 1980 Winter Olympics held in Lake Placid, New York, a young American ice hockey team full of college players stole the show as they made their way to the medal round games. The Soviet hockey team had won gold medals for the past four Winter Olympics. In a stunning victory, the underdog American team defeated the Soviet team and ultimately went on to win the gold medal against Finland. The 1980 American men's hockey team has been dubbed the miracle on ice because of the unlikelihood of potentially beating the Soviets and much less winning the gold medal. Of course, film also showcased the tense rivalry between the Americans and the Soviets as Rocky IV pinned the American hero boxer Rocky Balboa, played by Sylvester Stallone, against the Soviet machine-like boxer Ivan Drago, played by Dolph Lundgren. The heroism and romanticism of the rivalry played out in an epic final boxing match scene with Rocky triumphantly defeating Ivan and turning an entire arena of Russian spectators and politicians into Rocky superfans who were willing to overlook 40 years of Cold War tensions. Even professional wrestling played out the good babyface American hero against the evil Soviet heel. Pictured below are wrestling superstars Nikolai Volkov and Hacksaw Jim Duggan, played to American crowds' fixed mindset of the evil Russian and the righteous American. The final five slides focus on the end of the Cold War throughout the 1980s and early 1990s. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev and American President Ronald Reagan rekindled the spirit of detente as both leaders sought to improve American and Soviet relations. Gorbachev also recognized the imperfections in the Soviet political and economic systems and sought to reform both. Gorbachev enacted perestroika, or a restructuring of the Russian economy, 
in that restructuring, Gorbachev allowed for a decentralization of the economy so that the Soviet government would no longer have complete control over production and consumption. Gorbachev also implemented free market enterprise and began to allow for private ownership of land and the means of production. Reminiscent of Vladimir Lenin's new economic policy in the early 1920s and paralleling Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping's liberalizing of the Chinese economy during the 1980s, Gorbachev ended the five decades of the brutal Soviet command economy. Gorbachev also invoked a policy of glasnost, or an openness of the Communist Party, and the Russian government to public criticism and political opposition. Glasnost allowed for the declassification of Soviet government files and led to a greater dissemination of governmental information to Russian citizens. These policies were the beginning of the end of the Russian Communist Party's iron fist-like rule over the country. Gorbachev and Reagan, in a groundbreaking agreement, signed on to the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, or INF Treaty, which led to the limitations of nuclear proliferation and the destruction of a large number of existent nuclear weapons in 1987. Prior to 1991, several Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe broke away from the Warsaw Pact as their communist parties were either overthrown or defeated in newly established open elections. In Czechoslovakia, the Communist Party peacefully stepped down in response to growing demonstrations against their rule during the Velvet Revolution. However, in Romania, a violent revolution took place that ended with the televised execution of Nicolae Ceausescu, the Romanian leader and head of the Romanian Communist Party, and his wife in 1989. In Poland, the Solidarity Movement, a movement led by Polish workers, replaced the Polish Communist Party by winning more seats in the government through Poland's first free elections since before World War II. In an iconic gesture toward German reunification, East and West Berliners tore down the Berlin Wall in 1989. Russia's Communist Party and the entire framework of the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991. Churchill's Iron Curtain, at least his description of it in Europe, was finally gone. In 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, several former Soviet republics in Europe and Asia gained their independence. You can see those newly formed nations on the map and the list shown on this slide. In 1987, President Ronald Reagan, in an iconic moment in Cold War history, pontificated to Mikhail Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Here's a photograph of the iconic night of the beginning of the tearing down of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when young East and West Berliners climbed over the wall and took sledgehammers to the wall and reunited with their long alienated German brethren. The wall was officially demolished in 1991. Today, parts of the wall are still preserved and are adorned with murals conveying peace, unity, cooperation, environmentalism, and other liberal liberalized movements that have characterized Germany since the end of the Cold War. This map of Europe in the years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the independence of the former Soviet republics and satellites in Eastern Europe. Notice within just a few years of the end of the Cold War, both Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia began to break up into multiple nations. The end of the Cold War brought an aura of positivity to societies throughout the world. However, the end of the Cold War also inaugurated a sort of post-Cold War uncertainty that our world, nearly 30 years later, is still existing in. 